make it one of the richest countries in the world, you know, um, ahead of many European countries. You know, there's a lot of money here in Africa. Mm -hmm. It might even be channeled in the right direction, necessarily. But there's a lot of money here. And Gavi showed that that money could be tapped for liberation purposes. Sure. She did it. So Gavi was self reliant. That's the reason why he built his Black Star Line Shipping Corporation. That's the reason why he built his Negro World newspaper. That's the reason why he built his Negro Factories Corporation that ran laundries and supermarkets and you know, groceries and butcher shops and restaurants and hat factory, doll factory, trucking business, you know, rest, um, hotels, schools, all kinds of businesses the UNIA ran in and around New York. And all over the country, where the UNIA existed, it did the same thing. Up to the day, some of the original buildings bought by the UNIA back in the 20s still exist in the organization, up to the day, despite all the problems over the years, up to the day. Gavi wanted to demonstrate the black folk that it could be done. And he was very successful in so demonstrating it could be done. Gavi's impact was great, as you know. He built the largest mass movement in the history, not only of our race internationally, but in the history of our race in individual areas. The UNIA is the largest mass movement in the history of Afro America. It's the largest mass movement in the history of the Caribbean. It's the largest mass movement among our people in Central America. It's the only truly pan-African movement that I know of on the African continent. A movement that existed from West Africa through Central Africa, South Africa, East Africa. I know of no other political movement on the African continent like the Gavi movement that united so many different areas of the African continent. That's the kind of impact that the Gavi had. Later generations that came after Gavi also were inspired by him. We know for a fact that many of the great Leaders who came out of our struggle in the 60s, 1960s, and 50s and 60s were people who had direct contact with Gavi move, Gavi's movement. Malcolm X, for example. Malcolm X mentions in his autobiography that his father was a Gavi. Yeah. That's right. He doesn't elaborate, he just mentions it and keeps going. Yeah. Last week when I spoke in Detroit, after the lecture, a gentleman came up to me and said, My name is Wilfred Little, he said. He said, I'm Malcolm X's older brother. So I took the opportunity to visit him next day and we had a long talk about this aspect of Malcolm's early life, the Gavi aspect. Because I, I always wanted to, you know, to flesh out what Malcolm had said in the autobiography. And so Malcolm's brother was able to tell me that their father, Malcolm X's father, wasn't only in the UNIA, he was head of the UNIA in Omaha, Nebraska. He left Omaha and went in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He became head of the UNIA in Milwaukee. Malcolm X's brother told me last week that Marcus Garvey used to visit their house in Milwaukee. He stayed in their house. This is where Malcolm came from. A house where Marcus Garvey himself used to visit and stay when he was in Milwaukee. In the autobiography, Malcolm doesn't mention his mother, but apparently the mother was also active in the movement. Malcolm's mother was the secretary of the UNIA. Omaha and Omaha. Malcolm's father used to organize people in Lansing, Michigan, and Flint, Michigan, and take them to Detroit to UNIA meetings. So that's the kind of legacy, you know, those are the kind of vibrations that Malcolm absorbed. And as we all know, when we teach children, when we expose the little children to influences, you know, it's like it's like money in the bank. It might take 20 years, you know, to get the interest, but you never know, you never know. It's always good to instill positive ideas in children because it's going to come back to something. Malcolm himself might not have been fully conscious of where some of his ideas came from, but clearly they were around the houses he was growing up, and he absorbed them, he got those vibrations. And of all the leaders of the 60s, I think Malcolm comes come closest, perhaps, to Garvey in terms of his ideas, you know. It's almost like, it's almost like reading Garvey. When you read Malcolm's speeches, it's almost like reading Garvey. That's right. Elijah Muhammad himself, who Malcolm worked for, was a Garvey guy. That's right. Elijah Muhammad was a member of Garvey's organization from Detroit, Michigan. A member of the UNIA, Elijah Muhammad, and then many others. Even at the level of mainstream electoral politics, Shirley Chisholm, first black woman in Congress, Shirley Chisholm tells us in her autobiography that her father was an ardent Garveyite in Brooklyn, New York. Shirley Chisholm tells us that her first recollection of anything political was when she would be taken by her father to UNIA meetings in Brooklyn, New York. Congressman Charles Dix in Detroit again, his father also was a Garveyite. And there are many, many, many others. So Gavi's influence has come right down in a way to our generation.
the African continent too, Jomo Kenyatta, the first president of independent Kenya. He was a guy there, did his youth. The ANC, the African National Congress, was a, was a thoroughly Gambian organization in the 1920s. The ANC in the 50s split into the ANC and the PSC. Those who remained in the ANC went in a more integrationist direction, but those who split into the Pan-Africanist Congress, the PAC, they continued the Gambian tradition. So until today, the PAC branch of that struggle is still a very Gambian organization in South Africa. The first Governor General of Independent Nigeria, Yambi Azikime, he tells us in his autobiography, his first political stirring came when he read a copy of Gadu's Negro World newspaper back in 1920. Kwame Nkrumah, perhaps the greatest of all the Pan-Africanists in modern Africa, President of Independent Ghana, 1957. Kwame Nkrumah tells us in his autobiography that the book which had the greatest impact on his political development was Gadu's philosophy of opinion. It's Kwame Nkrumah. I mentioned earlier the Black Star Square in Ghana. And that's the reason why you have a Black Star Square, because Nkrumah, when Ghana became independent, he named the Black Star Square after Garvey's line. He named the Ghanaian shipping company the Black Star Line after Garvey's line. The first independent African country in West Africa in modern times, you know, British West Africa, had a Black Star Line named after Garvey's line. And like I said, there are many others who could be mentioned. Gabi's impact, therefore, was as worldwide as was his, you know, his field of activity. Mm -hmm. And because of Gabi's worldwide impact, because of his great success, Gabi called him to being a really formidable array of enemies. One way of looking at the success of a great leader is to look at those who have done battle against him or The greatest powers in, in the world in Gabi's time expended you know, millions of dollars of their resources fighting Marcus Gabi. And those kinds of people don't waste millions of dollars fighting people who they consider unimportant. <laughs> all the imperialist governments of the world struggle against Gavin, all of them. England, France, Belgium, the U.S. of A. The communist world, the communist international struggle against Gavin. Gavin was a very unique leader insofar as he had both the right and the left struggling against him. At the same time, Gavin coming from all sides. The imperialist world was struggling against them. The communist world was struggling against them. The integrationists in this country were struggling against them. All the major organized forces in the world were struggling against Gavi at the same time. And it really is almost a miracle when you look at what Gavi achieved. Because here was a man who built the greatest, most influential movement among our people in history in the face of this kind of opposition. How do you do it? It's almost a miracle. Every year when Gavi had his conventions, the US government would send somebody to arrest him in the middle of his convention. One time it might be tax fraud or some income tax you know, or something or other. One time they tried to arrest him. They didn't, but they tried. They were thinking one time of arresting him under something called the Man Act, M-A-N-N, -N, also known as the White Slavery Act. This White Slavery Act was an act which had been brought into being to counteract international prostitution. In Europe, there was a you know, for many years an international prostitution network whereby white women would be sent to this country, to Argentina, to Japan, all over the place as our prostitutes. And so they passed this act and they, you know, saying that any woman who was sent across state lines for immoral purposes, you know, you know, that person across state lines would commit a crime. 